Okay. Well, thank you everyone for attending our third New Mexico Smart Grid Center webinar series. Uh, my name is Ann Jekyll. I am the Associate Director of New Mexico EPSCoR. And for our webinar today, we have a really great lineup from Los Alamos National Laboratory and Sandia National Laboratories, Arthur Barnes from Lanel and Jay Johnson from Sandia. And they'll be presenting on microgrid related research that is relevant to the New Mexico Smart Grid Center project. All of these webinars are recorded and archived, so we will put them up on our website afterwards and you can access this information. Uh, I also want to point you toward the question and answer box on our webinar feature. So via your Zoom interface, if you have any questions for our panelists today, you can type them into the Q&A box and we'll, we'll have a little bit of time for uh, Q&A. So please look for that. Uh, usually at these webinars, we announce the next webinar that we'll be having, but we will take a break for December due to the holiday break and start up again in late January. And right now we are planning out our spring semester webinar topics. So if you have an area that you would like to hear about, if you would like to give a webinar yourself, um, please contact me and um, we can look at fitting that in. And in addition, we will be sending out a poll to our entire project team to find out which day of the week might be the best day. Um, we might move it off of Fridays. We'll probably keep it at noon. So we, we want to hear from you about the best day for you. So with that, um, I am going to cede control of the interface to Arthur Barnes from LANL. He's a power systems engineer in the information systems and modeling group at LANL. His current interests include geomagnetically induced currents and electrical transmission networks, analysis of protective devices and design of microgrid systems. And he has a PhD, MS and BS in electrical engineering from the universities of Arkansas, Florida and Colorado respectively. I've heard a lot about the work that he's doing up at LANL and and I'm pleased to hear more about it today. So thanks, Art, for joining us. Go ahead. All right. <clears throat> Afternoon, everyone. Um, so I've uh, already been introduced, uh, so I don't have to do that. Um, so what I want to talk about today is um, a look at um, protection of inverter interface microgrids. And in speci in, uh, specifically, I'm going to be looking at uh, admins protection and how does this perform um, in the absence of uh, high fault currents, such as you would see in inverter interface microgrids. Um, and you know, are we able to uh, detect a fault? So the first thing I, I'd like to go over with everyone is why is microgrid protection um, uh, difficult? Um, so there's a, a number of reasons for this. Uh, the first one is um, a, you're, you know, when we typically think of microgrids, we think of um, them being supplied by um, inverter interface generation, you know, be it uh, you know, uh, spark ignition engines, uh, micro turbines, uh, PV. Um, also, microgrids will operate in uh, both islanded and grid connected mode. So we can get very different fault currents on um, different operating regimes. Um, in addition to this, uh, we may have microgrids that have um, a mesh structure as opposed to uh, a radial structure. Um, so all of these are difficult for traditional distribution system protection. Um, traditional distribution system protection relies around um, overcurrent. It also relies on assuming that the structure of the grid is radial and microgrids break this. The uh, current um, industry practices in microgrids is actually um, kind of embarrassingly simple right now. It, they generally still rely on overcurrent protection, um, either 
uh, zero sequence or a negative sequence. Um, this is usually focused on protection for the purpose of protecting the uh, generation. And it also relies on the assumption that all the elements of the microgrid are, are pretty close to each other. So if protection operates, it, generally the um, generation is going offline along with the entire microgrid. Um, going forward into the future, um, this may not be the case. Um, we're, we're looking at the idea of microgrids, which are uh, networked across distribution systems. So generation can be spread over an area of miles. And when we get to this stage, um, being able to have protection that operates selectively and minimizes outage areas is fairly important. <clears throat> so the first question um, that came to me is, you know, why, why don't they use differential protection? And the answer to this is, you know, for microgrids, which have uh, a large number of load taps, if they're supplying an industrial facility or residential area, uh, we wind up with radial lines coming off of them uh, where there's a sufficient number of nodes that we can't uh, cost effectively uh, provide differential protection on every line. Uh, so, this steered me in the direction of admittance protection. Um, however, it, it's certainly not the only possibility. Um, one solution that has been proposed is providing fault current on microgrids, uh, say with uh, traditional generation or synchronous condensers or induction motors. Uh, however, uh, this is a bit of a step backwards. One of the nice things about microgrids you know, and inverter interface generation is they don't provide fault current. Fault current's dangerous, it can damage equipment, and we'd like to find a solution which you know, takes advantage of the lack of it. Um, uh, steered me in the direction of transmission system protection, which you know, although it operates in the presence of fault current, you know, it doesn't strictly rely on the ability of generation to provide overcurrent, as is the case of traditional distribution system protection. And there's a number of options which are uh, listed in the slide, uh, of which um, admittance or, or distance protection is one of them. In this uh, presentation, I prefer to use admittance protection, because uh, as I'll show uh, further on, um, it, in microgrids, it's generally fairly difficult to estimate the distance of a fault, especially in uh, ones that are relatively spatially compact. So again, going back to you know, what's happening in industry uh, these days, um, I, you know, they're generally using um, still over current protection. Um, they rely on a negative sequence and zero sequence protection, which can work if uh, loads are close to balanced. Um, however, if we have a lot of loads that are single phase circuits, you know, such as residential or office loads, if we have a fault on one of the single phase circuits, we can lose that, um, increase uh, the unbalance of the system, and this could trip the negative sequence or zero sequence protection uh, erroneously. Uh, so. It's not a ideal solution. <clears throat> so now let's look at admittance protection. Um, the first thing to consider with admittance protection um, in a inverter and phase microgrid scenario is that inverters behave very differently from synchronous generation. And what dominates the behavior of inverters is their control systems. Uh, current um, state of the art in microgrid controllers is a move away from controllers in a rotating reference frame, uh, such as uh, DQ0, which is commonly used in industrial motor drives, 
to uh, static reference frames, you know, either the Clark or um, the, just the raw ABC coordinates. Um, the Clark um, coordinates, if zero sequence is not supplied by the inverter, uh, it will only require uh, two, con uh, two controllers for the alpha beta coordinates. Although zero sequence is also included, then it requires the second, uh, uh, third gamma coordinate. Um, so I think current uh, practice is favoring using uh, ABC coordinates, uh, but with a proportional resonant controller, which is able to provide zero uh, steady state error um, at 60 Hertz. Now, what happens during, during faults? Uh, in a inverter, uh, the thermal time constants of the semiconductor switching devices, is, they're very low compared to uh, the copper in a synchronous generator. So they can overheat in, in seconds or even less than a second. So the strategy is to limit their current during faults to you know, within twice that of uh, rated current. There's a number of ways to do this. One is instantaneous saturation. Um, this isn't ideal because it introduces uh, very high harmonics into the system during the faults. Uh, so a preferred solution is a set reset solution, where when the inverter detects that it's uh, reaching an overcurrent condition, uh, the inverter, which is operating um, in voltage regulation mode, will then switch to uh, current regulating mode. Um, so where the affected phase will supply rated current and the other two phases will attempt to regulate voltage. <clears throat> now, uh, now that we know what's going on with the inverter, um, let's go into a, a little um, review of Edmunds protection. Um, so I'm considering uh, ground faults for this presentation. And in this case, I'm using it means protection with current compensation. And so the uh, top equation that we see, um, this is equivalent to measuring the positive sequence impedance uh, of the line. Uh, in the case of line-to-line uh, -line faults, um, ZLL is also equivalent to measuring the uh, positive sequence of a line during a fault. And this is beneficial uh, because of the question that I'm asking in this uh, first bullet point, which is uh, the ratio of positive negative sequence uh, voltage to current. Um, and we'll see in the uh, following slide uh, that this first quantity uh, will actually give us a distance to um, the, the source or, or a generator as opposed to the, the fault. Um, so that will completely screw up protect and coordination. <coughs> Um, now here's a look at a, a small case study system. So this is a, a free bus system uh, with two lines uh, and a terminal load. And I'm looking at a line to ground fault um, between these two lines. Uh, when I break out the system one line into its individual conductors, uh, we have a look at what, what the line to ground fault looks like. And what this results in is Neglecting the load, uh, we're going to get a fault current along phase A, and phase B and phase C will be a, approximately zero current. <clears throat> if I break up uh, the three-phase circuit into its equivalent sequence networks, uh, what I, and then I use the uh, inverse sequence transform, what I see is the sequence component of the fault current um, they're all equal. And this gives me a interconnection of the sequence networks where they're all in series. Uh, doing a little bit of simplification, I, I got the, a Thevenin uh, equivalent circuit. And I'm able to calculate what the current is measured by my relay. Now, what we saw in the previous um, interconnection of sequence networks 
um, was there's only a positive sequence voltage. Now, for the case of an inverter which is operating in current limiting mode, as I described, uh, I now have the presence of uh, negative and zero sequence voltages on my equivalent sequence networks. So the voltages and currents uh, that I'm going to be measuring are now going to be somewhat different. And this gives me uh, a new simplified network where I get a second source, uh, which is equal to the uh, sum of the zero and negative sequence voltages uh, produced by the inverter. Uh, fortunately, um, as I, I show uh, analytically and in simulation, uh, current compensation for distance protection is uh, robust against unbalanced operating conditions. So it's able to correctly calculate uh, the impedance uh, between the relay and the fault uh, under both um, uh, analytical uh, and simulated cases. <clears throat> now, uh, there's still potential issues with this protection method. Um, in particular, uh, the most uh, significant issue is in a relatively small microgrid, the line impedances are going to be negligible compared to the source impedance of the inverter. Uh, so this means that what I had to do was set the operating region uh, for the admins protection to be very large. So th that's why I'm, I'm using the term advins protection as opposed to distance protection, because I, I can't reliably estimate where on the line uh, the fault is. And this means that in order to maintain protection coordination, uh, I'm dependent on using uh, pilot relaying. And if, if the pilot relaying fails, um, then I'll end up with an outage area that's uh, greater than um, necessary. Um, now, uh, given the requirement for a communications channel, um, it does, uh, does open the door to uh, more sophisticated protection schemes. Um, so one particular set scheme that I've been looking at recently is that of state estimation based protection, which has been proposed uh, both on the transmission and distribution system. And this is a generalization of uh, differential protection. Um, and it's able to operate uh, with the failure of uh, one or more sensors uh, while still being able to discriminate between um, in zone and out of zone faults. So that brings me to my conclusion. Thanks, Art. And I would encourage everybody, if you have any questions on his presentation, to type them into the Q&A box in the Zoom interface. I don't see any as of yet. Uh, and so maybe we can have a joint Q&A at the end of both of the presentations. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce Jay Johnson from Sandia National Laboratories. And he is a principal member of the technical staff at Sandia, and he, where he leads several multidisciplinary research projects focused on power systems control, electric vehicle charging, distributed energy resource cybersecurity, and renewable energy integration. He has seven patents and has authored over 100 technical publications and will be presenting today on a recent project that um, they undertook at Sandia. So uh, take it away, Jay. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Uh, I assume I'm sharing my screen. Is it showing up on your end? Yes, I see it. Okay, fantastic. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about distribution voltage regulation using DER grid support functions. This was a component of a larger project uh, a solar energy technologies office funded project under the energized solicitation and it was a pretty big project between uh, the doe contributions and our cost share it ended up being a five million dollar program with a number of partners that you can see here 
uh, a piece of this effort was looking at different methods of doing voltage regulation on distribution systems. And uh, we took a lot of this work um, from kind of a conceptual level to an actual field deployment. So that's what I'd like to walk through today. If I can operate my screen. Uh, so just uh, taking a few steps back and talking about the context here. As you know, PV is growing very quickly. As the cost is dropping, you see more and more penetrations of both uh, distribution connected devices as well as we're starting to see some higher voltage level connected equipment. Uh, as, and, and that could include energy storage systems as well, which uh, have a lot of the same capabilities and functionalities as the other PV systems. Problem is that as we install all these devices, we run into different technical challenges at the distribution level and the transmission level around voltage and frequency regulation, protection, which we just heard a lot about. Uh, and we need to come up with solutions to those challenges in order to continue installing renewable energy systems on our, on our grid. And so one of the obvious solutions here is advanced inverters, which include a suite of grid support capabilities that actively support the grid voltage and frequency by changing their output characteristics. They have a high tolerance to grid disturbances, that's like the voltage and frequency ride through. And they interact with uh, grid operators and or aggregators using communications. So that's the interoperability capabilities of, of these devices. Uh, and so we have some research questions based around that. What's the best way or technique for providing this voltage regulation? And how can we evaluate uh, these techniques prior to actually doing a field demonstration? And so uh, that's what we're trying to address with this project. So just very briefly, uh, conceptually, uh, distribution voltage regulation is, is kind of depicted here. Traditional power systems from a distribution substation down to the secondary, you see a dropping, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'll kind of sketch it here. Uh, you see a voltage dropping with distance from the substation down to the end load. And so if you look at your voltage, you can get lower and lower voltages. Uh, typically what will happen as you install PV systems is especially towards solar noon, you're injecting a lot of uh, current and this is increasing the voltage there. And there are a couple of limits that utilities have to abide by. Uh, these are the ANSI range A and B limits associated with that voltage band. And they, they need to operate within this to not damage equipment and to um, provide you know, a, a good service to their, to their customers. And so the, the question is, well, okay, we can potentially add some additional equipment to this system as we install PV to correct for this problem. Or the more cost effective technique would be to use the capabilities of the inverters themselves to help bring down that voltage and control the voltage um, uh, by communicating or, or using autonomous grid functions uh, programmed in these devices. And so that's, that's what we're trying to do here. So that brings us to the project, right? Uh, the project was called Prodromos, which is Programmable Distribution Resource Open Management Optimization System. Uh, the idea was, as shown on the right, that we'd take uh, voltage regulation power simulations, probably in OpenDSS is typically what we use, convert those to real-time simulations in an OpalRT environment, and then we can run power hardware in the loop simulations where we actually connect physical equipment to the power simulation uh, prior to doing the field demonstrations, which we did with National Grid. And so by stepping through each of these uh, layers of fidelity, we were able to improve um, or, or provide uh, some sort of confidence that our approach was going to work in that field environment by adding more and more fidelity to the operations. And so the three different uh, grid support, or, or I guess the voltage regulation techniques that we used, uh, which used different grid support functions, were distributed as autonomous control, which is the volt bar function in our case. Uh, a technique called extremum seeking control, where you inject a reactive power ripple by multiple DDR devices and pull out their influence on a, on a 
global objective function based on that ripple. And then a more, I would say, a more traditional optimization approach where we use the state estimator to calculate the optimal power factor set points for the devices. And so volt bar is pretty straightforward to understand what that is. Based on the local grid voltage, uh, we inject or absorb reactive power at the device. Uh, the two other probably less well-known capabilities are extremely seeking control, which is depicted here, and the optimization, which I'll talk about on the next slide. So in this one, uh, what we have is uh, shown on the right here, a few different inverters that are all injecting a probing signal that's a reactive power ripple. It's a relatively low, you know, think maybe, I don't know, a, a period every, uh, I don't know, 30 seconds or so, something like that, a relatively low periodicity in terms of the ripple. Each of them have different frequencies. And because of that, you can extract their influence on a globally uh, transmitted objective function. In our case, since we didn't have the ability to broadcast that objective function, what we did was we pulled in data from the field and then calculated the objective functions uh, locally and then submit it and sent uh, each of the inverters the um, reactive power set points that they needed using a power factor set point. And so while this is rippling like this, really it'll trend in one way or another based on the gradient it, it sees based on this ripple. So a little bit complicated, but hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, the last technique is based on a uh, particle swarm optimization technique using uh, an OPF, optimal power flow, where we take and measure uh, from the power system and a bunch of intelligent electronic devices like PMUs, micro PMUs, uh, the inverters themselves, different data that is passed to a Georgia Tech state estimation tool called WinIGS. It calculates the current states. We export that into a particle swarm optimization routine that um, instantiates a bunch of power factors for the different DER devices and then runs the optimization on that to calculate the optimal power settings based on uh, an open DSS simulation running here. And then those power factor settings are then communicated down to the end devices. And the objective function that we're trying to minimize is shown here, um, essentially, uh, we wanted to minimize cases where we're exceeding the ANSI limits. Uh, we don't, um, you know, you, you minimize that essentially when you get closest to the nominal voltage and a power factor of one. And the power factor component is, is uh, some crude method of considering the economics of it. So if you're operating off a unity power factor, you're not producing, potentially not producing uh, as much um, real power and therefore generating as much money for the customers. Okay, so in terms of methodology, we've got um, uh, a few steps in this process. Uh, we collected distribution system uh, models from our two uh, utility partners, PNM and National Grid. These were in OpenDSS and SIME. Uh, we converted those to OpenDSS models and then in order to run these in real time using eMegasim in Opal RT, uh, we did a circuit reduction technique. Uh, this, this is some work that uh, Matt Reno has done here at Sandia for many years. And so you can see we, we went from you know, 9,300 lines here on the left down to just 32 lines, which could be modeled in uh, Simulink and run in real time. And then we put that in a real-time simulation environment uh, using RT Labs and or RT Lab, and then we uh, connect the real-time simulation to a power uh, a DER simulator that presents the active and reactive uh, power set points of multiple DER devices uh, to the simulation. And then we, in, in the final stage here, we connected physical equipment and replaced some of those simulated uh, DER pieces of equipment with uh, actual physical inverters. Uh, we conducted the experiment at DETL, the Distributed Energy Technologies Laboratory at Sandia here. 
Nettle uh, is a highly reconfigurable laboratory with about 150 kilowatts of PV coming into, I'd say, probably a dozen different inverters, and we can hook up different things to either PV simulators, grid simulators, different load banks, create uh, single phase and three phase microgrids, and do a whole host of other experiments. Uh, but in this case, we were using a programmable DC power supply, which is our PV simulator, to create a highly variable voltage or highly variable irradiance profile, uh, and our AC um, grid simulator, an Amatech simulator, that was connected to the Opal RT to provide that uh, hardware in the loop uh, feedback. Okay, so it, looking at how this works in the bigger scheme. Um, on the bottom uh, of the image here is uh, DETL, so our lab. Uh, inside the Opal RT real-time simulation, we have a distribution system running. We've got PMUs connected to each of the buses there, and each of those PMUs are exporting uh, C37118 data streams to a physical SEL 3373 uh, phaser data concentrator. That data is then exported over the public internet to our um, connected energy software vendor, which was running the Georgia Tech WinIGS state estimator. Uh, so it completes the state estimation and exports that as another C37118 stream to the PSO. We calculate the set points for the devices and then uh, feed that back to the EPRI PV simulator as well as our physical uh, hardware in the loop devices here. And so that's how you close the loop on the optimization. Okay, so let's, let's start taking a look at some of the results. Uh, for the PNM uh, use case, uh, you can see a simulation here. It's about 1,500 seconds. I think if I remember right, that's uh, four and a half hours or so. Uh, and the the, the simulations show a lot of variability. We wanted to use high irradiance variability to get a sense of how these voltage regulation techniques would perform. And we ran the cases um, for a, uh, a few different uh, runs. Uh, so running baseline, volt bar curve, extremely seeking control and particle swarm optimization uh, for the, each of the phases that's shown up here. But I'll, I'll focus your attention on the, the lower image. And so you see a, a large line running down this plot, which represents the average bus voltage for the entire feeder. And then you see two patches. Well, you see multiple patches here. But the patch represents at the upper side the maximum bus voltage. And the, it stretches down to a lower point, which is the minimum bus voltage. And so this gives you a sense of average min and max, or min, min and max of the um, of the feeder. And so it, it's a nice way to represent it. Although when you plot everything on top of each other, it's pretty hard to understand. But in brief, uh, for the baseline case, which is the gray or the black one, you see we're pretty high voltages on this particular simulation. When you add bulb bar curve, which wasn't a very aggressive curve, you improve that a little bit. However, if you use the extreme seeking control, you can see the probing signal impact on the bus uh, average bus voltage here. Uh, but it, it tends to get very close to nominal voltage at, at 1 PU. And then particle swarm optimization is the blue line here. It also does a reasonable job of, of uh, pulling the voltages close to that nominal value. And so we wanted to come up with some sort of metric or scoring for these different simulations. And we, we came up with this. So we're just integrating over time uh, a scoring for a baseline test uh, minus the voltage regulation case. And so if you, uh, on the baseline case, uh, moved from that point down toward nominal, you would score better. And so Voltvar had a you know an improvement in, in terms of this metric of about 13%, and the extreme seeking control and particle swarm optimization did much better, like a 75% improvement. So so not bad. Uh, now we'll oops, now we'll go to the national grid simulations. This one 
turned out to be much more difficult. So we wanted to simulate just using the three-phase inverters at Old Upton Road, which we had access to for running the field demonstrations. Uh, in this case, on average, the voltage of this uh, system was very close to nominal, but uh, there was a phase imbalance. And so um, phase A was pretty close to nominal, but B was high and C was low, as you can see in the, in the right plot here. And so when we ran each of the use cases, everything pretty much stayed more or less the same, right? It, it couldn't improve the uh, voltage on this particular feeder, even though it was imbalanced, because um, it, 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 when you change the power factor for these devices, it changes the power factor on each phase. And so if you move it up or down, it actually gets worse overall. And so uh, we, had, we ran into a situation that we couldn't solve for that. And so, but we wondered, well, okay, there's also some single phase devices on this. In, in an event that we could control all these inverters, uh, how would that improve things? And so we ran that simulation as well. And what we see uh, compared to the top, which is just controlling the, the large old Upton Road site, compared to the uh, all the inverters, we actually do see quite a bit of improvement uh, because each of the single phase inverters is able to pull that phase toward nominal. And so you get uh, an improvement, in this case, extreme seeking control does quite well, of 15%, uh, 38%, and 17% uh, for the different methods. Okay, so based on all that, we're, we had some confidence that uh, our controllers were working and we were ready to go to the actual field demonstration. And so for this, we were communicating to the old Upton Road PV site uh, that the National Grid owns. Uh, we had another point on the feeder shown in the lower left that we had a feeder monitor there, uh, and we could pull currents and voltages off of that uh, measurement point. PV is hard to see, but kind of here, you can see my cursor. Uh, and so we, we went ahead and we ran each of our test cases. Uh, in the case of the particle swarm optimization, however, uh, we had one major hurdle to get across, and that was that we didn't have enough field data to complete the state estimation. And so what we did was, uh, I think, a, a little bit clever technique where we used a digital twin. So we ran the power hardware in the loop, well, the, the real-time simulation, at the same time that we were running the field demonstration. And so to populate the state estimation, what we did was we um, basically pulled the measurements from the, the simulated PMUs in the real time in the real time simulation, as opposed from to the from the field, and we sent that to the state estimator, uh, which was then able to solve, and then we could calculate the optimal power factor set points, and then issue that to the end devices in the field. Um, of course, there's a lot of uh, challenges associated with that. Uh, we're not really capturing live load data. We do know the irradiance at that PV site based on measurements, and so we can use a curtailment function to send the curtailment to uh, the simulated inverters. And so we're, we're getting pretty close in terms of active power contribution from each of the DER devices in the simulation. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, we also don't know really any of the settings for the actual field in terms of um, you know, tap changing uh, transformer positions or voltage regulation equipment if it's on or off, cap banks, et cetera. So it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a rough estimate, but it seemed to work pretty well for us. And so here is an example run for that. Uh, I'll just, you know, there's a lot going on here, so I'll just kind of point out a couple of things. Uh, the, the first thing is in the image in the upper left here, you can see active power for the digital twin and the field inverter, and so they, they match quite well. So we're monitoring the, the inverter in the field and then setting a curtailment level in the simulated device to match that. 
uh, for a comparison of bus voltages at the point of common coupling for that. You know, a little bit off, this could be partly due to the other voltage regulation equipment that we're not accounting for, don't have visibility into. But overall, the trends match reasonably well, I, I would argue pretty well there. Uh, and then, so for the optimization, as, as we saw before, there's not a whole lot that it can do. Um, and so the voltages in average um, are shown here for the feeder monitor in the blue and purple increasing, and then the point of combine coupling in red. The active power is the yellow line, and the forecast, uh, based on our forecast, is the green line, which is a persistence longer term, like more of an energy forecast than an actual power forecast. And then the reactive power contribution is quite relatively small. It's shown here in the orange. So it, it seems to work reasonably well. I won't say it's perfect, but for uh, for in order to run this optimization, it was a good technique. And so we here are the results for a baseline, the volt bar control or a volt bar curve, and extreme seeking control and particle swarm optimization. Um, it's essentially impossible to compare these uh, because there's going to be different set points for voltage regulation equipment on the feeder. There's also obviously different irradiance profiles. The, the PSO run had high variability, whereas the baseline was a nice clear day. And so it, it more or less just shows that in all cases we're relatively close to nominal voltage. So the red lines here are close to unity. Um, or sorry, uh, one PU, and you can see in the uh, the extreme seeking control case uh, that that uh, reactive power ripple and its influence at the point of common coupling there. Uh, so that you know, if if the system is sensitive to that, that's not too good. Um, but in the case of the particle swarm optimization, again, operating relatively close to nominal and just just sitting uh, sitting there pretty much for the whole run. So, in conclusion, uh, we so we uh, demonstrated that this incremental approach, moving from pure simulation to real-time simulation to the hardware in the loop environment, and then a field demonstration, was a good approach. Um, the communications between each of these elements is a, a major hurdle and takes quite a long time to debug, um, but we could verify that through this process, and it built our confidence that it would work in the in the live demonstration. Uh, the digital twin was necessary to get over the limitations of our state estimation system because it was too sparse without those uh, simulated PMUs. And VoltVar did well. We didn't have it too aggressive, but it did improve voltage regulation, especially on the PNM system. Extremum seeking control is a viable means to do um, control over fleets of DER devices. Uh, we tended to bundle these into a couple of different frequency uh, groups for the, the demonstrations on the larger system, on the national grid system, uh, but, you know, that's in the details. Uh, the state estimation-based um, particle swarm optimization technique was, was pretty good. It, it worked with uh, sufficient telemetry. Uh, it's, of course, the hardest to get operating because you have to have so much information and, and be solving these, uh, these state estimations uh, essentially in real time or, or near to it. Uh, it. It took us about, I think, um, you know, one minute to close all the loop in terms of that, that cycle. Um, and I guess in terms of open questions and observations, um, we're very interested to know if the old Upton Road PV system could have solved this problem if it had the ability to do negative and zero sequence current injection. Um, I know there's some work at the Austrian Institute of Technology developing an inverter that can do that. So you can inject different reactive power levels per phase. And so that would solve that issue there. And so I think there's quite a bit of research that could be con conducted in that space to, to solve that issue. Um, yeah, uh, communications uh, continue to be an issue in terms of getting data from both field systems 
and then just like moving them between these different elements of this ADMS uh, uh, system, you know, larger tool uh, is quite a pain in, in constructing all the PMU traffic uh, between the components. Took an uh, extensive period of time. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I think that kind of touches on the software interoperability issue and how we're, we're still struggling with that and a lot of what we're doing. So that, um, that's it for me. I'll open it up to, I guess, questions at this point. Thank you, Jay. That's great and um, very relevant to a lot of the work we have going on in the New Mexico Smart Grid Center. Uh, I'd encourage all attendees to type your questions into the question and answer box. And um, we have a couple of, of follow-up questions for you, Jay, um, just now. Um, one is if you think you'll pursue the digital twin strategy again, um, that, that's a new technique that you'll use. Uh, well, um, I would be very open to it if, if a project came along that would need that technique. Uh, right now, I don't have any work pursuing this line of research, unfortunately, but I think it, I think it can solve a lot of those issues. And so if you have, if you want to do global optimization on feeders or larger systems that you don't have full visibility into, if you have a real-time simulation that could be run in parallel to pull kind of pseudo measurements off of. Uh, I think that's an absolutely uh, valid approach. I mean, you're not going to do any worse than than just guessing, right? So it, it's going to be going to be as close to as accurate as you can get, given that you don't have a lot of data. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, another question was about um, coordinating across so many different entities for this project. It, it looks like you had a ton of collaborators and utility partners and multiple sites. And if you had any lessons learned for how to best coordinate and um, merge models together and you know, something that we'll be looking at in the deployment component of this project also. Yeah, I mean, that's always a challenge, right? Is you have to balance things. The way that we structured program management for this project was we had fortnightly group meetings with everyone to just bring people up to speed. But oftentimes we'd have, you know, daily or, or maybe even weekly uh, calls between people running the programming side of things and trying to connect components together and, and solve things. And so you have to analyze where all the touch points are and address those things um, independently of these large group calls. It just, you can't do activity level work if you're having everybody on the call effectively. Okay, yeah, good advice for our team. Um, this is for both of you and it's not research related, but um, that's something that our folks are curious about. Do you host interns or work with undergrad or graduate students? And what are the best ways to pursue working with Sandia and LANL if you are a student? Yeah, I, we have student postings all the time on our website. Uh, I don't know the exact thing, but sandia.gov will, I'm sure there's a link there for employment opportunities and you can take a look at our postings. I do know that our group in the renewables and distributed integration uh, research area uh, is actively trying to find summer interns. So if you're interested, please take a look for our postings and send a resume. Great, and um, I'll, I'll kick that to Art also at LANL and, and here, um, what are the best ways for students to reach out to you or, or LANL to work on these types of projects? And I, I believe you're on mute right now. Okay, um, so yes, uh, LANL also has um, open uh, student postings. Um, uh, um, although uh, we're also always open to uh, academic uh, collaborations. Um, so um, one of the, the big things within um, our group at LANL is uh, we have a, you know, a focus on you know, trying to make sure that our work is open sourced and you know, other people uh, can use it freely. Um, if you look for uh, LANL ANSI on, on GitHub, you can uh, see what we've been working on. And, and I encourage you to 
uh, go and take a look there. Okay, thank you. And, and a follow up to that, when, what are the, the key skills you're looking at for students who you want to come work with you? Um, what, what kind of background or skills do you want them to have? And um, I'll, Art, yeah, start mm -hmm. with you. Okay, sure. Um, so, um, uh, at least in the uh, power and energy se sector, um, you know, people familiar with um, you know, obviously, a traditional power systems background is uh, very is helpful. Um, also, um, people coming from uh, computer science and operations uh, research um, that that's also quite useful because um, much of our power and energy work has tend to be uh, optimization focused. Um, al also, we are you know branching into machine learning. Uh, that that's definitely uh, something that Lionel has been putting. Uh, Quite a bit of work into um, so you know such topics as uh, outage forecasting, um, being able to infer um, electrical networks based off of um, uh, ge uh, geospatial predictor variables. Uh, you know these are all um, uh, major areas that we're uh, working in right now. Great, very helpful. Jay, do you have anything to add to that for what uh, you look for for students at Sandia? Yeah, there, well, there's a lot of things that we're looking for, but I'd say kind of the core themes in a lot of the postings revolve around strong analytical skills, programming expertise in Python or MATLAB or others. Uh, a lot of um, work we're doing now on power systems, of course, um, communications and cybersecurity, uh, looking at analytical models to solve resiliency questions. We've got um, a lot of work just, you know, large data sets, machine learning, how do you crunch numbers, how do you manage databases, things like that. And particularly for me, I like, I like candidates who have some lab experience. So if you've worked with hardware in the past and know how to connect physical pieces of equipment together to, to make them run, uh, that, that's certainly a, a strong positive for a candidate. Great, thank you. And um, one final question for Jay, and I think then we'll wrap up our webinar for today. Um, you mentioned that your your funding ended for the project that you overviewed. Um, are you gonna continue threads of this research and, or what are the next research questions that you're going to pursue based on this work? Yeah, call up your state representatives and have them send more DOE funds our way, right? <laughs> no, I, uh, we are, yes, we, we have a large suite of research programs in this area. This actually was just one, one project in a larger, much larger program of doing protection and voltage regulation at the distribution level. Um, Matt Reno and Robert Broderick here continue to do a lot of uh, work in that space. And we're doing a lot of hardware in the loop research now, uh, branching into wind systems and other, um, hopefully, electric vehicle chargers. And I, I think, yes, uh, these core questions of voltage regulation on distribution systems come up all the time as we start changing uh, the mix of generation on our power grids. And, and so there's, yeah, there's quite a bit of work. Um, both at just the modeling side and also at the power hardware in the loop uh, uh, level. Okay, thank you. Well, I'd like to thank um, both of you, Art Barnes and Jay Johnson, uh, a tremendous presentations today. Thank you for your time and uh, sharing with us. And that concludes our webinar today. Thanks all. all right, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.